And we are live without our yes, other host couple. We have no idea what they're doing, but you know, maybe they're taking advantage of this okay. opportunity with kids in bed to create a Zoom generation. What would appreciate that? Folks, we are so excited that you are all with us here for the Parental Pow Wow Live. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Night three. We're really excited, and you kind of saw what uh, the lineup is tonight. We're really excited. We've got a daily word with Father Mark Moretti, a very dear friend of ours from Arlington Diocese. We got house call again with the Elmore. He's very excited yes. that they've been sharing with us so just good. some great insight woven into faith on the health reality of maybe being at home and some considerations that have been really helpful for us. We've got music from John Trabick, if you can find his way to this room. That was a little bit of the reason we had a delay here. We had to get him to the right place. We got a marriage story being shared from the Noltners, a very dear couple, good friends of ours, and I know you're really going to love that. We got a special feature tonight that we're throwing in this, and it's for those moms and dads who are not used to having their children being at home or being at home with them. So you might call it some coping, some encouragement, encouragement. some reality, uh, and we're calling that, what are we calling that? Homegrown. Homegrown kind of the metaphor of, uh, let's see who's calling us. No idea. Walt. Walt, okay. Can you go see what's going on with Walt? We are really live here and we're so glad that you guys are good with operating with the mess. We've never done this before and it certainly is a lot of fun. But before we go any further, I just want to share with you some of the news. If you don't get the Wall Street Journal, um, obviously we're getting a lot of bad news. And note, I'm going to emphasize news, bad news. So we got that stocks ended the worst quarter in 12 years. That's not very nice. It's not very good. And then we got a little article down here, a nurse's tale inside New York's crisis. I just want to read this. Um, Christina was hoarse, her nose swollen by mask marks. She wasn't sleeping much and woke up crying one morning after a day at work. She said, I feel like we're being sent to slaughter. Mrs. Norstein is an intensive care nurse at Montefiore Medical Center, Moses Campus in the Bronx, one of the hospitals inundated with COVID-19 patients. In hospitals across New York City and elsewhere in the country, nurses and doctors are complaining about a lack of safety equipment, insufficient staffing, and murky policies and other challenges. New York City accounts for the largest number of COVID-19 cases in the US. On Tuesday morning, the city reported 40,900 cases and 932 deaths. If you make your way through any paper or any news that we see, we know it really covers uh, our world right now, it colors the experience that we're having, we and our children, right? Um, I could read so many more. And uh, I simply wanna say, Steph, I gotta get your beautiful face in here. Sorry. I simply wanna, to there you somebody. go. I simply wanna <laughs> say what? I wanna say that Euangelion, it's a big fun word, but euangelion, it's the root Greek word corresponding to evangelization. Euangelion literally means good news, to good news somebody. So as I just presented bad news, we are gathered here tonight to acknowledge God's sovereignty, to acknowledge that he is overall, even if we don't feel it, <laughs> even if we don't experience <laughs> it. Are you texting? Or uh, you... No, I'm trying to, you just keep talking. You're awesome. Well, all right to let someone in. I could do that. There we go. They're there now. Finally. Okay. All right. Good. So even in these circumstances, we are being challenged to find real faith that we profess. Um, the, the difficulties at home and around us are an invitation for us to gather on these nights as couples and really seek to be more anchored in the very character of Jesus Christ. So I want to share there. with you guys another, another little board yeah. here. So hold tight. Welcome, Erickson's. Welcome, Sorry Erickson's. about the uh, troubles. Technical difficulties. Technical issues. I think Walt was afraid of the hat. I, think <laughs> I believe so. I think maybe. So, Michigan folks, take man. a look at this. If you read Stephen Covey, which is one of my favorite books, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, <laughs> he shares with us this great insight that in Chinese, the word crisis involves two characters. So crisis has two characters contained in it. One represents danger, 
You might think of the paper that I just shared, some of the stories that surround us, but the other character represents opportunity. So we are here tonight to kind of acknowledge that in these difficult circumstances, dare I say brokenness, things that don't work, our plans being ripped up, who knows what's gonna happen with the economy and these challenges. In the midst of that, we proclaim the opportunity that God is giving us here and now. So we're now gonna welcome our host now that we're all together here. So let's begin with the Ericsons. Glad you're able to join us, Walt and Liz. Who are you people? And we'll just, who are you people? Who are you? <laughs> I am Walt Erickson. And this is my lovely wife, Liz Erickson. And we are the parents of seven children, one in heaven. And, and one of yours. I think sometimes Gracie calls yeah. us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think so too. Parents of a couple adopted kids now and then. Um, we, we live uh, just over the border from Sylvania, Ohio in Michigan. And we go to Holy Trinity in the huge town of Assumption, Ohio, that has one stop sign. Yeah. Awesome. That you don't acknowledge usually. Right. Excellent. No, I don't. <laughs> Unless somebody's coming. Waskoviches. Okay. I'm Jean Waskovich, and this is Mike. And we have eight children and six in heaven. And we moved to um, the beautiful Huron, Ohio in 2018. And we go to St. Peter's with Father Jeff McBeth. Another shout out. Yes. That's awesome. Awesome, awesome pastor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, before we get to Mike's memes, a very beloved part of our program, where Mike, because it's alliteration, Mike's memes, he gets to share the memes. He's pulling some good memes. And tonight yeah. we have a special feature in a moment. But you guys are part of the powwow. We need you to powwow with us. So if you're in Facebook, please you know, click on the image, whatever it takes to get to where you can join us through the comments. We are reviewing the comments through the night. We welcome you being part of this. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna ask you just to kind of join us tonight is who is one person who has been a particular blessing in your life over the past two weeks? You get one person. We know you could list a bunch. And if you're worried about people knowing the last name or whatever, just give us the first name. So join us right now. Outside of spouse? And outside of spouse. We'll say outside family. of spouse and family. Who is one non-family member who's been a blessing to you in the last yeah. two weeks? And join us there. You can kind of see we're following with our old little tablet here, and we want you to be part of that. And we'll ask you other ways of interacting, but we do invite you to participate there. So check in right now at Facebook Live. And uh, let us know who is somebody who has been a blessing in your life. We're going to get back to you in a second. With no further ado, we are going Drum to roll. the memes of Mike, which I need to find the little share button again. Share button? Um, you're asking me? There it is. <laughs> I found it. Okay. So, Mike, All right. with well, no further ado, here we go. It's April Fool's Day. These are late. So if you're preparing yourself... I probably should have played these last night so you could wake up ready for what your the kids were going to bring as an onslaught. So this is the most overused meme in meme world or in the ether. <laughs> so, so I wanted to brace yourself that these memes are coming. Awesome. We don't, have, we don't have too many today. You know, I actually learned this one from my father-in-law. <laughs> Just don't trust anybody. <laughs> I guess today you get a free pass. This is just words to live by, words of wisdom. That's I ranked this one up there with don't take any wooden nickels. Yeah. Nice. Like it. Now, if I could be a guy on TV, this is probably who I would be. Uh, you are he, far more debonair and dashing than him, Mike. I don't know. The the I have hair in me. <laughs> so. That's true. But you have your hat on. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, and. Uh, <laughs> Can you imitate him? One. Can you imitate him? Well, I, I really can't imitate him. But I do feel like that every morning before Janine brings me some coffee. Like, where are we going? And, you know, the coffee helps me and she wakes me out of my out of my uh, haze. But, uh, you know, everything today, just look out. Uh, it's, you know, have your warning signs up. Woundaba. And? Okay, this was my favorite because we can't leave the house. So I thought this one was cute. <laughs> I like that. I like yeah. that. Yeah. 
<laughs> Let's put our hands together for Mike's memes. <laughs> All right. Okay, we are I back with you guys. I think in one in there by the end of the I week. I think Liz left the house. She left. She's gone. What? She saw that dude and she figured that uh, it was competition or something? No, we have a we have a kid with a bloody nose. Oh. That's the problem. Oh, oh man. That's well, going to happen. Yes. Do you want some of the blessings? So, Are yes. So, Steph, please read some of the blessings people have shared. Again, Facebook Live. You can even be typing them in now. You're part of the program now. Uh, Steph is now going to share the person that was a blessing to you in the past two weeks. Go ahead, Steph. So, Christy shares that it is her dear Liz Erickson, Bill, his buddy Vince, who just recovered from COVID-19, mm. uh, Deacon Mark, Lauren DePore, or DePore, not sure if I'm saying so it right, says, so we know a that. young teacher who has helped me learn the technology to teach online, mm. Suzanne, my lit group friend family, woo, woo, woo. Um, Kathy says Joan Miller, Aww. and... That's what we got for you so far. Okay, awesome. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Absolutely. So, folks, I am now going to welcome our wonderful priest tonight, Father Mark Moretti. I have to tell you a little bit about this awesome young man who's from the Diocese of Virginia. He is a Arlington, I'm sorry, Arlington, Virginia. We go way back to the 1990s. We were seminarians together at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, the most impressive seminary on the planet. I know Father Mark will not dispute, dispute that. <laughs> but I will say as a young preethy, Father Mark invited me to join him at a number of different, very spiritually enriching opportunities. One was to meet the Sisters of St. Paul, uh, who are very good friends of his, and a number of other occasions of just retreat and connection. When we initiated at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, a praise and worship night, they have a beautiful glass chapel in Emmitsburg. If you ever get a chance to go to DC, it's worth going out of the way just to be on that hallowed property. But you, there's one of the beautiful shrines behind there and there's a glass chapel in the woods. And I got permission from the rector to lead praise and worship. I was just the runt of the litter. I'm just a pre the a philosophy and all these theologians that were older than me, Father Mark being one of them. But he was really a help the champion uh, that opportunity for us seminarians and so is beautiful. We had adoration, praise and worship, and as a deacon, he always celebrated. But one of the most unique and notable things for any of us who've really like action films, which I know Mike, you, and Walt like action films. So Jason Braveheart. Bourne, for instance, I want you to picture Jason Bourne, all right? And relative to <laughs> Father Mark, Jason Bourne is a Cub Scout. <laughs> Cub Scout. That's what comes to mind. Father Mark, yes, he was a member of the CIA. He kept America free and safe for decades. I don't know if it was decades, but it sounds more impressive. Before yeah. <laughs> he discovered his vocation and became the, the, what he is today, an awesome man of God, a keeping good brother in Christ, in different way. keeping us safe in the spiritual warfare <laughs> that's going on. So Thanks am I that. allowed to ask, does he have floorboards in his den of which he has passports, cash, go right. back. Right. Well, as the saying goes, Mike, he could tell you, but. Uh, <laughs> he'd have to kill me. There you so, go. There you Father go. Mark, we warmly welcome you to our uh, experimental fun in the sandbox gathering of parents seeking the kingdom and working it out in the mess where we know the Messiah is. And thank you for being present with us tonight. Thank you. Wow. What an introduction, Greg. I can't live up to that. You know better. <laughs> uh, it's so good to see all of you there. I, I take it that this is linked into a larger group, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, then I send greetings to everybody who's out there. Um, it's the first time I've ever done this. This is great. Awesome. Um, I've done radio interviews in Washington, D.C. Um, I've done uh, radio uh, interviews with the Bishop of Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Bishop Pates, uh, when Tom Neal was director of communications out there. So we did a one hour broadcast all around the Midwest, but this is very nice. It's kind of a little closed group and uh, it's cool. It's awesome to have you. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, would you like me to start with a prayer? Please do. Okay, why don't we do that and then I'll go right to today's gospel. Awesome. Wonderful. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. God, our heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your presence in our lives. 
we thank you for letting us be part of your heavenly family. And in particular, we glorify you for the holy sacrament of matrimony. Because, Lord, it is through this great gift of man and woman, united in love, united in prayer, bringing forth the next generation, that we see your goodness shining forth in so many wonderful ways. As we begin this evening of praise and worship and love, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit upon us so that everything we say and do will give you great honor and glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Amen, amen, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if the son frees you, then you will truly be free. I know that you're descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no room among you. I tell you what I've seen in the father's presence, then do what you've heard from the father. They answered and said to him, our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father. So they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Great, guys. Well, I'll give you just a quickie on the Gospel and then a little bit on, on more relating to the, the evening of all of you gathered together. We are um, going through close to the end of the eighth chapter of St. John's Gospel. A couple chapters earlier, you know, our Lord gave the famous Bread of Life discourse. He started with the multiplication of the loaves, the spectacular miracle. And then he allowed that to be a segue into all of his disciples learning that he would give us his true body and blood, soul and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. And obviously a very powerful statement, which created a lot of controversy. And as John records, a lot of his disciples went back to their former way of life. Then we jump, jump ahead two more chapters. It begins with the woman caught in adultery, right? And the Lord forgiving her and telling her not to do that sin anymore. And then this leads then into this discussion about uh, the origins of Christ and the fact that he's again trying to make them understand, hey, you have God in your midst. God himself is talking to you. And he wants you to, to accept me in this regard. So it's pa fascinating just the tension that's going on there. And it's, of course, it's leading up to Holy Week with all of the uh, sad events, you know, with the um, betrayal that would be eventually come to Christ through Judas and things like that. So just it's sort of setting a framework for all of you. And I hope that you'll get a chance to continue your daily scripture readings. Greg said something which is so true. I uh, join with you in feeling bad that faithful Catholics like yourselves and your kids um, can't be going to daily mass and receiving communion. Uh, this virus thing is the most unprecedented thing I've ever seen. And it's certainly the reaction in my lifetime. So what I would say to you is just hang in there because the Catholic church has been around for 2000 years. And the one thing we've got going for us is we know how to cope. You know what I mean? We're very, very good at coping. We've put up with everything you can possibly imagine. So we'll get through this. Before you know it, we'll get back to mass in public. People will receive communion once again, the bread of life. Now, I am hoping, and I'm, I mentioned this to Greg also in a, in a Facebook post, that this will generate something very positive. And that is a deeper hunger for Christ in the Eucharist and a deeper reverence when receiving the Holy Eucharist and that people will really perk up when the priest starts preaching on the reality 
of the miracle that occurs when that bread and wine is brought forward by you to the altar of God and through the prayer of consecration is brought back to the people of God as the true body and blood of Christ in the form of a sacrament. And in fact, if the people who had heard Jesus in John chapter six had had faith in him, instead of walking away, they would have been invited to the Last Supper and they would have found out that in fact he was truly going to give us his body and blood in Holy Communion, which we've celebrated for 2000 years. So that's important. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about having communion uh, with Christ and his body and blood, there's another communion. And this is the communion between a husband and a wife. And it's amazing because if you stop and think about St. John Paul II, he did something, yeah, I know, I love it, Steph. He did something <laughs> remarkable. He, uh, in his Theology of the Body, uh, which was a 20-year discourse, a series of sermons that he gave, and I'm telling you, there are kids that haven't even been born yet who will write their doctoral dissertations in the 21st century on this man. The, the guy was a, an absolute paragon. But when I was a kid, um, you know, you had the sacrament of holy orders and you had the sacrament of holy matrimony, and they seemed to have their own separate spheres, you know, like the priests were here and the lady were over here and neither the twain shall meet. But the genius of John Paul was not to show the separateness of these two sacraments, but instead the interrelatedness. And what John Paul said was that you cannot have good holy Catholic priests without good holy Catholic families to generate them. And you can't have good holy Catholic families without good holy Catholic priests to sanctify them. And so instead of there being this separateness, he brought together and showed the interrelatedness. And I think that is something that we really need to be glorifying God in each and every day. And so underneath all of the difficulties and the scandals and things that have occurred in the last 20, 30 years that have been brought forward, there is a remarkable undercurrent of good solid priests that are shouldering on, loving their flock, caring for their kids, showing them the true love of Christ, in the midst of all of that decay and sadness. And that's gonna be the new springtime that John Paul talked about. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of give you all a little bit of hope in the midst of all this darkness and chaos and things like that. Now, when it comes to the sacrament of marriage, and of course I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, I would emphasize to you the importance of the sacramental side of marriage, right? We all know about the practical side, but you know the, the importance of it being truly a sacrament that a husband and a wife celebrate together. You often hear people say, as they're getting married, getting ready to be married, oh, I'm gonna go down to the church next week and Father Mark is gonna marry us, right? Well, that is a very sentimental thing to say and it obviously reflects the love that they have of their priest, but it's not technically true. Um, I'm not gonna marry them. Uh, the boy and the girl are gonna marry each other. And the priest is going to be there simply to bless it and to tie a tight knot. And so if I've done a good job, then they can get me out of the old priest's home 25 years from now and put me in a wheelchair and bring me back and I can do their, you know, their, do their silver <laughs> anniversary. So that's the beauty of it. And that's the thing I want everybody to understand is that, you know, you, you, know, you become the Reverend Greg, you become the Reverend Stephanie, uh, you administer the grace of the sacrament of marriage to each other every day. And as you unite in your love with each other, both in body and in spirit, you bring forth kids, you know, and it's, that's a tremendous blessing. And then the future shines on brightly. And so I, I just think those things are remarkable. So one thing I would remind you is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, he said to every one of, it's almost like he's speaking to married couples, seek first the kingdom of God and God's friendship, God's righteousness, you know, and everything else will be given to you beside. And there are times, you know, when you get into the thick of it and you're every day and you're going to make the bills and you get the kids out to school and you got dental appointments, you got all these things that are in your, in your mind. Sometimes you can lose that sense of priority. And frequently, and over the years that I've been a priest, 25 years this year, I've had many couples come to see me for marriage counseling. And... <laughs> They all basically say something along the lines of this, Father, we've been married six, seven, eight, nine years, got a few kids, and we feel like we're going around and around in a cul-de-sac with the same old issues over and over again. It's driving us crazy. 
And I look at them and I say, okay. I said, well, what are your priorities? And they go, uh, the job. I said, okay. And then what? Uh, the kids. Okay. Well, where's your husband or wife on the list? Well, they're usually third or fourth after a hobby like golf or video games or something like that. You know, <laughs> uh, where's God on the list? Well, if Jesus is on the list, he's been pushed down. He's around seventh or eighth on the list. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of smile and look at him and I said, well, you know, maybe we ought to get back to Luke and Bach, Texas, you know, let's get back <laughs> to what's most important. Put God number one, put your spouse number two, put your kids number three. And then you can rank order below that, whatever's important to you, the job, the in-laws, a new car, I don't care, you know, but you got to keep those uppermost in your mind because what frequently happens is something pushes itself in your life up into an echelon that it doesn't belong in. And then it creates this sense of chaos and bewilderment and everything else. Like then you begin to think that your spouse doesn't love you, your spouse doesn't care. And that's the work of the devil. He's just trying to, you know, destroy the unity that God wants you to have. So that's one thing that I would definitely do is keep focus on the idea of Christ first, my spouse second, my kids third. I went down to visit a family and they asked me to bless a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And then they put it into this beautiful little grotto that they built in the front yard. And uh, then they brought me in for cake and coffee. And so I sat down in their living room and what they had done on the wall opposite the sofa was just that. They had a a photograph or a picture at the top of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Then they had a photograph right below that of the husband and the wife. Then they had a photograph of the five kids. Mm -hmm. And what they were saying to people that were visiting their house was that's the priority. That's the thing that's supposed I to be. I love that. Isn't that beautiful? By the way, I went to visit them not too long ago. And I said, how's it going now that that statue's out there? They said, great. We haven't had the Jehovah's Witness knock on our door one time <laughs> after this. You know what I mean? So... Now, I just want to get practical for a minute, and that is with regard to you guys, because I'm so glad that you're doing this, that you're taking time as a husband and as a wife, a father and a mother, to just have an evening by yourself. Get yourself a nice glass of wine, you can chill out, and you're talking about things that are ultimately important, and that's getting to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. I told Greg earlier that a mutual friend of ours, Father Joe Donenville, is a chaplain out at a parish in a uh, Illinois. It's also the chaplain of a high school. And so he would ask all the incoming freshmen, what is your priority? What is your goal in life? And boys would typically put down, oh, I want to be a baseball player. I want to be a successful farmer. I want to operate a big business. I want to go into the military. He said this one boy put down, my goal in life is to get to heaven and bring as many of my friends with me as I can. And I said, are you serious, Joe? He goes, yeah. He says, believe me. He comes by it honestly, Mark. I said, well, good. You know, hold on to that kid. But that should be the goal for a husband and a wife, right? You know, husband says, father, my goal in life is my, to get my wife to heaven and my kids to heaven, you know, or father, you know, my goal in life is to get my husband to heaven and my kids to heaven. You know, you, you work on that highest of all goods and that's to get to heaven. And you use the means of the church to help you with that, you know, frequent mass, confession, a family rosary, Divine Mercy Chaplet, all of those things to be able to keep your focus and uh, and to keep going strong in that regard. So that's one thing that's so important. And, um, and then the other thing too is uh, communication because a lot of couples will say to me something like this, and I only, usually always hear it from women. Father, he's not hearing me. And I always say, well, he's hearing you, but he's not listening to you, right? <laughs> you know? And it's not because he doesn't love you, but it's just, I think I've come to believe this, is that we have to test each other's personality. So Greg, I have a question for you. Oh no. Are you more of a morning person or an evening person? Uh, Steph, what would you say? More evening. of an evening person for sure, evening. Evening, okay. I mean, if the world was perfect, would you wanna be an evening person or a morning person? I like them both, so it's lame, but I'm just gonna say evening person to make it okay. easy. All right, Steph, what about you? Morning. Okay, see? So two opposite people, right? So the last thing you want to do, Greg, is to come down, you know, in the late afternoon and Stephanie's winding down. She just wants to sit down and have that second glass of wine. And you want to talk to her about something important, right? She's going to hear you, but she's not going to listen to you. And vice versa, you know what I mean? I'm going to do neither. <laughs> yeah. So knowing that, if you guys want to talk about something important, my recommendation would be 
Go out to Panera, you know, on a, on a Saturday afternoon at about noon, get yourself a cup of coffee, sit down, hold your hand, and then lay out what it is that you want to talk about because you're both clued in, you're both awake and alert, you're listening. And that's just practical advice, but it can be a big, big help, you know. Perfect. So, and we even talked about yeah. uh, having a date in the car since we can't right. go anywhere. Oh, did you? <laughs> And my mom and dad were funny because they were both morning people. I've never seen two people that could get out of bed and take on the day like those two. So on a Saturday morning, what they would do is they'd get up at about 6.30, 7 o'clock, go downstairs in the kitchen and make percolator coffee. I'll never forget that aroma. You know what I mean? It would just, you know, they'd boil it on the back of the stove. And the kids were told, don't even think about coming into the kitchen from about 7 till about 8.15 because that was my mom and dad's time they needed that <clears throat> and they really kept it sacrosanct i remember one time i tried to violate it. i'm standing there in my pajamas you know and, and my dad looked at me as what do you want i'm like cheerios <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> get, get him and get the hell out of here you know your mother and i want to talk you know i mean he was he was serious about that he was adamant you know so i would definitely say that that's the most important thing is have that time where you two can really have it on your own and it's your personal thing you know so and then the last thing I would do is talk about kids for just a minute. And, and that is education and nurturing, okay, and discipline. Because any parent who goes around and tries to be the friend of their child uh, is making a huge mistake. You, you, you're more important than a friend. You're a mom, you're a dad, you know what I mean? They can have all the friends they want in the neighborhood, <clears throat> but you are more important than that. You transcend friendship in the fact that you are the mother and the father. Uh, the energy that you put into that role, the, the love that you put into that role, the dedication you put into that role is going to just give you just wonderful benefits for years to come. When it comes to education, of course, that's primary. Talking to the kids about God, how to get to heaven, the Ten Commandments, the angels, the saints, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Keep their minds focused up there. Uh, make sure, of course, they get good grades in school. They have good discipline, stuff like that. My dad was the disciplinarian. My mother was the academician. So if there was anything having to do with the, the books, we had to go to mom. If it had to do with the spanking, we got it from dad. <laughs> it was as simple as that. You know? I'll never forget, I came down one time and I, you know, I had some kind of a math question. And I said, Pop, can you help me with this? He goes, no. He said, go ask your mother. It was like, you know, this is one of those things. So his attitude with discipline was funny. His, you know, when you got a whole house full of kids, Basically, his attitude was from birth to two years old, you never lay a finger on them because they're just too little. They're just running around the world. You know, they're crayons on the wall trying to you know, figure things out. He said from two to 12, he said, that's a different story. He said, that's <laughs> the era of crime and punishment, right? You know, he said, you give them three fair warnings and a whack on the rear end and go to your room and don't come down until I tell you to, right? You know, and then yeah. as my dad said, you know, a teenager, you have to change gears again because you can't spank a teenager. <laughs> they, they got enough problems, you know what I mean? Just those chromosomes kicking in and, you know, messing with their head. So instead, you have to go psychological on them. You have to ground them. And, you know, your mom and I are so disappointed in you. I can't believe you did this. And, you know, I remember one time I was about 13 or 14. I did something boneheaded, you know, and I said, Dad, can't we just go back to a good butt whooping? No, no. So I'm not going to move on, you know, that kind of a thing, you know. So, and I'll tell you, this is something that I hear as a priest, and this will freak you out. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, I was talking about the fourth commandment. And I said to the kids, I said, well, what's a venial sin against the fourth commandment? And they said, oh, you know, disobeying mommy or daddy, right? You know, rolling your eyes at them, right? All this kind of stuff, you know, okay. I said, well, what's a mortal sin? And I was talking to the fifth graders and they were like, you know, killing your parents. So I said, yeah, but that's also the fifth commandment, right? You know, but I said, you know, as a child, I said, can you strike your mother or your father? Oh, no, father. I said, yeah. I said, can your mom or dad strike you? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's no problem. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, you know, obviously you don't want to hurt your child, but just give them enough pain to make them realize, say, hey, you little brat, you know, you stepped out of line, smack them on the shoulder and say, you know, get your act together. But that way you kind of just maintain that sense of control and normalcy and things like that. And believe me, there is love in the routine. When kids know that they're coming home to a mom and a dad who have the house ready to go, there's a meal on the table, check the homework, get yourself in the bathtub, scrub it up, 
get your PJs on, come down, give me a kiss, let's do our prayers and go to bed. You do that for 13 years, you know, from kindergarten to the eighth grade, you're helping those kids out a lot. I mean, from kindergarten to, uh, yeah, you know, all the way through, you know what I mean, right? So that would be the best way to handle children, if you ask me. And I'm sure a lot of you could probably sit there and tell me stories until the wee hours of the morning about how important that is and how the successes that you've had and everything like that. So, so there it is. There's the sacrament. There's the two of you. There's the kids. And I hope that's just a little bit of an overview that, you know, kind of gives you some food for thought and some good things to discuss. Father Mark, you are now a blessed member of our community and we, we uh, <laughs> pledge our prayers and our regard for you. We'll have to have you come in sometime and maybe do a retreat for us, a marriage or family retreat. We'd love to have you here with oh, us. That'd Before be great. Before we say adieu, just any quick thoughts from the uh, peanut gallery here. And also you guys there in Facebook <laughs> land, feel free. Give us some comments, thoughts, what'd you think? But uh, just stand out points, Waskovich's and Erickson's. Well, I, I think uh, when you were in the CIA, you were either doing psyops or waterboarding. I mean, you definitely have a lot of experience. <laughs> actually, and, uh, I, I actually had both sides of the river. I started off at the CIA and then I transferred over to the Department of State. So I was I was working in the intelligence analysis area, and then I became operational as a special agent in the State Department. Wow. Yeah. Well, really practical uh, advice. Uh, we ha Our kids are from 22 years old down to five. Wow. It, it depends <laughs> on what hat I have on. Okay, how do I deal with a five-year-old versus the high school person? You know, I take their phone away or I take whatever away. Mike, so, isn't that a water board behind you in the background? <laughs> isn't that a water board I see back there? That's exactly right so as long as you know you don't leave marks you know so far the police right. have not been called that's right that's that's my attitude my father said you give them just enough pain to make them realize hey you stepped out of line you know <laughs> i really like you dad <laughs> liz walt thoughts yeah i uh i actually could listen to you all night uh your advice is sound um we practice a lot of it but uh, you know a lot of times you you need the support right? You need the wisdom and support. You Sometimes you, the, the world starts telling you what you're doing isn't quite right. And so uh, you, you need that support. And I appreciate that. And um, Arlington, Virginia. So the last time I was at the March for Life, I had this enormous uh, F-250 pickup truck and I uh, went out to dinner. Okay. And um, we come back out. My truck is gone. I thought it was stolen. And here, come to find out, they towed it, <laughs> even though I was in a parking spot. So what they told me was my vehicle was too big to park in the parking spot that I parked. Really? Oh, so that was my experience of Arlington, Virginia. Oh, I'm so oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. More positive now. Well, the March for Life was beautiful. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so from our friend, Italian, uh, resident Italian friend, Deacon Mark Genovese, I'll leave you this comment. And he said, well, what can I say? He's Italian. No wonder he's got a great priest. No wonder he's a good priest. He doesn't really talk like that, but I had to I had to throw that in there. Hey, hey, well, listen, yeah. uh, Deacon, we love you. Uh, Deacon, <laughs> we love you. So awesome that you're with us and uh, know of our thoughts and prayers. But thank you so much. We're very thank blessed you, by your thoughts tonight. Thank, thank you, you, Father Mark. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Steph, why don't you introduce our next I think you should tonight. house call. Well, we love the Elmores. They're yeah. awesome. Dr. Rachel and Dr. Jeff. We welcome you guys. I guess I should probably get you out of the waiting room here so you can Thank actually you. join us. And they're, oh, oh. yay. <laughs> so awesome. they're it. setting up tonight's theme. So we welcome you for tonight's yes. house call. Woo -woo. Actually, can you see us? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. So actually eating, pretending to eat this plastic carrot was harder than my dumbbells yesterday because we're <laughs> fasting not that you should know that but we're fasting right now but as you can see i chose the carrot and he chose the ice cream cone there so but the, the thing is our kids think that this is a gluten-free dairy-free food <laughs> dye free ice cream cone so that's what they tell us when we order ice cream <laughs> Pretty good. is there such a thing definitely we have it all so yeah. <laughs> is it good but that. what we want to talk to you about tonight is fasting and your immune system. Mm -hmm. So we don't know about you, but we found the last couple of weeks, we actually have been stress eating um, with everything that's going on. 
Um, and actually the priest yesterday talked about having false God. And I mean, how food can be for us too. But the Bible mentions fasting 77 times. So obviously it's an important thing to do. Um, a Catholic author, Mark Frad said, you could say that prayer without fasting is like boxing with one hand tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. And that fasting without prayer is, well, dieting. And isn't that the truth? Because I am the first one to jump on my scale after Ash Wednesday, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus says to pray, fast, and almsgive, not during Lent, but always. And so how does that boost your immunity? Well, actually, studies show that fasting can reset the immune system. Because when we fast, it tricks your body and it says, whoa, what's going on here? And you actually lose white blood cells. But that actually triggers your body and your brain to say, whoa, we need to produce more. So that after, after an end of a fast, you're ending up with more white blood cells than pre-fast, which is great to boost your immunity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of our, um, we were at a conference in December with one of our mentors. This guy's a genius. He's a chiropractic mentor out of California. And we talked a lot about fasting in terms of our immune system. And one thing that he, or there were a couple of rules that we talk about with fasting for us is, you know, typically 12 hours is the minimum. So go without 12 hours without eating in a day. 14 is better, but 16 hours is optimal. So we want to try to stay and eat um, and fast, excuse me, fast within a 16 hour period. One of the other general rules of thumb that's really beneficial for it is to, um, to consume the last thing about three hours before you go to bed. So you have to be awake for about three hours before your last meal. And then the last thing is, it's really important is if you're hungry, drink water. Because most of the time it's actually thirst. But if you drink water and you're still hungry, then you need to eat. Your body's telling you, hey, I need to eat. So those are some of the general rules that we use um, but again, you know, there's certain health conditions and things like that. Talk to your doctor about before going on a crazy <laughs> fast, you know, um, but those are some of the general rules that we use. And so how do we implement this practically with us is, um, Monday through Thursday, we don't eat dinner. So we'll fast from dinner. We'll get up, we'll eat breakfast, we'll eat lunch, and then we'll wait until breakfast the next day. Um, which gives us an opportunity to talk to our kids. You know, we have five-year-old, five and a half, three and a half, one and a half while we're eating dinner and feeding them and doing this and all that, we, we found that a lot of times we were just emotionally like scarping down our food and yeah. like, wait, what did we eat? And did you taste that? <laughs> I mean, like, and so by doing this, we're able to, um, we're able to talk to them a little bit about fasting and talk to them about why we're doing it and the prayerful intentions behind it. So they, they get to see that. And then on Friday and Saturday, we fast from lunch. So we'll eat breakfast, we'll eat dinner with each other. Um, sometimes we'll eat dinner in front of the TV and watch a AFV, their favorite show. Um, and then Sunday, we just really relax and we eat all three meals together and just really just, um, just enjoy. enjoy the Sunday. So for us, that's how we implement it. We've tried different things, you know, like we tried, um, uh, skipping breakfast and eating lunch and dinner. And that was just terrible for my stomach at about 10 o'clock in the morning while I'm working on a patient, they're looking at my stomach saying, what is going on in there? So I figured out that that wasn't the best thing for me, but changing that up, it really, really benefited us. And isn't it neat too, when we eat, if we're not fasting and our kids are three and a half ago, why are you eating right now? You're supposed to be fasting. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa buddy. <laughs> this isn't the time. <laughs> so, you know, everybody has to come up with their own routine. Everybody has to come up with their own thing, but those are some of the general rules that would help your immune system. Like I said, 14 hours is beneficial. 16 hours is ideal. Don't eat before you go to bed. And, um, those are kind of the big things. Um, we talked a lot about fasting today. And then in the first two days, Monday and Tuesday, we talked all about prayerfulness and exercise and prayerfulness with present time moment. Um, so we've hit prayer and fasting, but tomorrow I'm excited we're going to talk about fasting from other things that are not food. And we're going to talk about how chemically those things play a role in our body uh, to help support our immune system. So that's what we're going to cover tomorrow. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. You guys are the best. So, so blessed good. to have you guys with us. You can, have, you can have one more lick, Jeff. One more. Oh, lick. thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Oh, hi, Jeff Jeff and Dr. There. Rachel Elmore of Turning Point Chiropractic. They're based in Perrysburg and they check them out. They bless many in a wide region. And as I said, 83.74% of our friends, <laughs> speak very highly of them. 
Before we say adieu, though, just any quick thoughts from uh, Waskovich's or Erickson's? Uh, well, just just go for it, Walt. <laughs> well, I, yeah, it's, it's uh, you just crushed me. I mean, I just Man literally up. got done Man eating up, my buddy. second dinner. She a half a pie. Earlier. She goes, look, he's <laughs> eating. She said that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the hobbits. What about third dinner? Yeah, third dinner. <laughs> oh, that's uh, awesome. So, Dr. Jeff, you know, if I am having a lot of water and I'm still mm -hmm. hungry, but in the that water is in the form of beer, percent <laughs> water, right? Should I just work on my carbs when I have to eat because of the beer. Should I go with tacos or pizza? Is there a carb? <laughs> oh man. Oh, let's see. Schedule the we appointment would... right now. Just schedule it. Make the there. appointment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come up to Perrysburg. I don't come think up you're to gonna... Perrysburg. You're gonna God bless you guys. Up. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you guys. We love you. We are now blessed to welcome our brother. Oh, maybe he disappeared. No, he's here somewhere. There he is. John's been patiently waiting. John Trabick, who is a uh, very gifted worship leader. He led worship at Franciscan University of Steubenville, and he's got a couple CDs out, a recent one that's really, really impressive. Went to Tennessee and uh, had a number of uh, really high-level producers work with it with him. He's a um, uh, minister at uh, Heather St. Downs, Patrick's. St. Patrick's and Heather Downs. And John, I don't know if you activated your, um, maybe you're putting kids to bed or something. I'll invite you to start your video or maybe you, it's a latency factor. There he is. Look Yay. at that. Wow. That's impressive. There's a guy who's got what's called a studio and tech savvy. So John, you are still on mute. I'm going to unmute you. I can do that. There we go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Awesome. What you got for us tonight, John? Just tell us, give hey. us a 411 on you and your awesomeness. Married kid? Uh, not, not that much awesomeness, but um, uh, yeah. So I've been leading worship for the last 10 years. Uh, before that, I was in a rock band. I was a drummer. Uh, and the Lord kind of took me from a path of wanting to become a lawyer to working in the church and using just like music as a way to evangelize and open hearts for people to come and encounter him. So that's my story in a quick nutshell. I've been married for three years, have two wonderful little kids that are both hopefully in bed right now. So, um, but yeah. And awesome. your dad is a deacon and Trebek Farms. Just give us a little bit on that. Yeah. So my dad is a deacon for the Archdiocese of Detroit been a deacon for almost 20 years now and so I grew up on a farm in Erie Michigan pumpkin farm we also do corn wheat and soybeans we, we do about 900 acres a year and the grain side of things I'm not very involved in much anymore but the pumpkin side stuff my whole family I have three brothers and a sister and a bunch of in-laws too and we all still help out in the fall so it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun so share with us what's this song all about yeah so this first song I want to play with you guys is a song on my new album, which came out in November. And this song's called This Is Jesus. And I have been praying a lot about just what would be a good song to share with you all tonight. And I think this song is, is, the, is the right song. So this song was written about two years ago, right before Easter. And I was I was going to the Triduum Masses, which are my three like favorite days of the year. And uh, I remember I came home one night and I was just in so much awe of what God, what Jesus did in those three days and just realizing that we can't sing enough about it. Like we can't sing enough about what he did. And so this song is just, it's just an anthem about who Jesus is and what he's done for us and just a song of thanksgiving for that. And I think right now, especially we're all being forced to ask the question, Jesus, who do I say that you are? You know, like I think for a long time we've lived in comfort being able to say, Jesus, you're God and I'm going to follow you. But now like stuff's kind of hitting the fan and it's like, Lord, I really got to like decide who are you and am I going to place my trust in you? And 
I'll tell you the last like three weeks, like the Lord has taken me deeper to realize like, I need to stop living in comfort and I need to put my trust in him in a deeper way and to, to really set my eyes on heaven. So that's what this song is all about. So I'm really excited to share it with you guys. So. Awesome. Extremely. <laughs> you are a true blessing to us, brother. And uh, we pledge our hearts and our prayers with you and your great gift, your ministry, your family, and uh, your new pastor, Father Mark Davis. Please pass along our love and our prayers to him. I will. Any quick thoughts, Erickson's Waskoviches? That rock, man. Yeah. Yeah. That was really good. Really, really good. 
Don, do you have a website that you can direct people to to hear more or to it's buy a CD? JohnTravicMusic.com. You can Ooh. find all the music. You can download it there for free. You can find it on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, all that stuff. Awesome. Nice. Um, the whole thing. So, so guys, John Travick, J O H N T R A B B I C music.com. Very blessed to have you with us, John. Know of our thoughts and prayers. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks so much for joining us. Yep. See you guys. Folks, so glad you're with us again. You're important, um, this parental powwow. And uh, we're just so blessed by this community that we have. Father Mark sharing in the Elmores and uh, John is sharing with us his music. We're now going to kind of go to the sort of the witness centerpiece of this. We're going to welcome the um, Noltners out of the waiting room. So there they are. Awesome. And uh, so my brother and sister here are two of the most special people that you could possibly meet and just such a blessing to us and to so many people in this area and uh, i'll let them share with you their story but i will say everybody we've asked to give testimonies here are here because um i think they want to live what they profess and together we realize we're not there and we're on a journey and just to mark those spots along the road over time is such a tremendous gift to have that community to work together, to encourage each other in occasion of support. And these guys yeah, are right yeah. up there, just so blessed to be there shoulder to shoulder with them in challenges, challenging times and good times and everything else in between. So, so blessed that you guys are with us. We give you Bill and Lori Noltner to share their story. Hi. Hi. I think we have a delay. Oh. It's all you. Can you hear us? We have a delay. We oh. have a pretty significant delay. Oh, okay. We'll do our best. Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess to start out, if you look at the uh, four squares of people on here, like Ernie would have said on uh, Sesame Street, which of these one these things is not like the other, and. Uh, <laughs> Our uh, journey to uh, be sitting here before you is uh, probably a little bit different than maybe, um, well, what would be prescription, let's say. Um, I guess we'll just start by talking a little bit about um, where we came from. Um, I grew up in a little town of uh, not too far from Cleveland called Vermillion and uh, Graduated from high school in 86, uh, went out to college, Kent State, for a couple of years, flunked out, uh, went to, uh, in between, I was I joined the Army, and right before I went in, uh, into the Army, I uh, met Lori, we were working at a, a bar, we were bartenders. Uh, some people like that story, so I'll briefly tell you that I was checking the IDs uh, at the door, and I saw her ID, which is, she came through and said, hey, you and I have the same birthday. And, uh, and she's like, whatever. <laughs> and so she thought it was some kind of a pickup line. Turned out it was true. But uh, we ended up working together um, for as bartender. She had, actually, she was on break from Bowling Green. She came in, uh, got a job, and that was the, that's how we get to know each other. And uh, we started as friends, and then her mom set us up. She can tell you that story uh, in a little more detail. Um, but, uh, and then, um, uh, between going away to the army and we stuck together and, um, came back and I started using, I started going to, uh, University of Toledo. I got a job at, well, first I got a job at Toledo Hospital and, uh, went, to, went back to college, tried second try and, uh, we moved in together. My mom and dad were not real happy about that. Um, so we, uh. I guess one of the things you'll, you would probably say about our journey is that uh, along the way, we've always been close to God. I grew up in a Catholic family um, and always felt like I had a good relationship with God. Uh, prayer life has always been something that was important to me. Um, but like many children, I loved my, my, my father, but didn't really always follow the rules. So. Um, then, uh, so uh, we got married in 1992 uh, and uh, started having children. And I'll stop there and let Lori tell you a little bit about her. 
Um, I don't know how far back you want to go. Well, past the dinosaurs. Life, but, <laughs> um, my my starting out story is pretty interesting. Some people find it interesting. Um, I was actually born um, and adopted by my grandparents. I was born to my quote-unquote sister, who I called my sister my whole life. So I was born to Diane, who was in high school, um, chose life and chose to try to raise me. Um, found out she was not ready yet to do that at 18 years old, so I was adopted by my grandparents. And I was raised in a Catholic family. My mom was originally Lutheran, um, converted to being Catholic for my dad, and then adopted. And I was with my mom and my dad, who were never went to church. Um, he went on to Easter. Um, I didn't know why, I never asked why, but um, so I went through all the sacraments, but I didn't really have a deep like connection or meaning to what was going on. I just did what I was supposed to do. And set up in the fire loft with my mom while she sang and probably didn't pay very much attention and went through emotions. Um, but I grew up in an isolated life. I was part of the family. I did all normal stuff and then just come into where I need to go, I guess. Um, as bartenders, um, but he plunked out at Penn State, I plunked out at BG, so I guess it was meant to be. Um, um, something good came out of it. So um, I started bartending, um, we became friends. I told my mom about him. Um, we kind of set him up one night, we went in there to have a drink, but we knew he was working and got off early. And then he came around and sat with us. And um, then my mom's like, oh, geez, I'm getting tired. I'm ready to go home. And I'm like, oh, I'm not ready to go home yet. And Bill's like, I can take her home if you like. And my mom's like, OK, see you later. Bye. <laughs> so, Sun Tzu would have been proud. <laughs> so she, she kind of knew. I guess my mom had a feeling. I guess moms know stuff. So um, we dated. And we he left for the Army shortly after we met. And our we, our relationship was mostly correspondence, written correspondence. Um, we didn't have cell phones back then, so right. I pen and Weird. paper. Lots of I learned a social security number really fast because you have to write it on every letter to <laughs> get sent. Um, I think we went through a few trials and tribulations being so far apart. It took a long time and doing a new relationship, but um, eventually, um, when he was done, um, we decided not to send him move in together and. My mom was good with that. His parents, they helped us move in. They were like, would you like this in Bill's room? Does Bill's dresser go in Bill's room? Because we had a two-room apartment. So that was kind of a funny joke. My sister was like, are they serious? <laughs> but um, anyway, so then marriage. Um, I always wanted kids. And I feel like I'm doing all the talking for one thing, but. Um, <laughs> Um, as having when we started having children, as we noticed it becomes a little more difficult when you're raised from two different um, two different families of origin. So that's a terrible. Thing. <laughs> Sorry. The rest of the I'm family looks the, great. Um, so we found Bill's family is very disciplined, and um, his mom was not super emotional, and my mom was very like excitable and happy in everything I did. I got praise for and probably because I was a grandchild type child but um so in raising play came to play and raising children and my mom also lived with us so to help us raise our kids because we both had to work so it was Bill against both of us so um it ended up working out but um we, as time went on we saw the um the complications from that dynamic them trying to be a disciplinarian and my mom and I tried to like fix everything before they got in trouble. Um, so that was that was an issue. And then um, we raised our kids Catholic. They went to Catholic school. They made their sacraments. But um, back then we were not very good at the at home part. I knew they did little prayers when they were children, sat in a circle and lit a candle, said the regular prayers. But um, as far as like teaching them a relationship with Jesus, um, I don't think we were really, I didn't even understand that part of it um, at that time. And um, 
we just I feel like we didn't do a very good job at that part, but we're getting it, we're getting it together now. We're almost done. They're almost all out of the house, so we're starting to figure it out. So hopefully we can pass it on to them so they can do a better job with their children from that aspect. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say that, that she was talking about the differences in the, uh, the you know the way we, the families we were working that we came from uh, definitely played a part um, in how some of the um, roadblocks or tribulations that we had uh, as parents uh, being on the same page, and um, you know my mom and dad uh, were both very strict, very disciplinary, and especially my mom, she's from the Philippines and. Um, they just have a certain, um, they're awesome people, but when it comes to raising kids, they don't, they don't play around. And, um, so that's the family of origin that I came from. My mom and dad were very strict about, um, going, going to mass, um, all that stuff. The thing that I took from my mom and dad though, that was the most important, I think their biggest gift to me, um, life, my faith. And their example is of hot of married love. Um, I think that when I look at what Lori and I have been through over the years, um, even though we're very different in our approach to life and, and even our approach to faith, um, the one thing that that is um, is uh, the thing we care share in common is this uh, dedication to our marriage. And for me, that came from my mom and my dad, and I know for for Lori, the same thing. Um, I would take a step back to when we met, um, the moment I fell in love with her, I knew that she was the woman that I wanted to have in my life, for the rest of my life. And when we got married, I mean, so, you know, we were corresponding back and forth in the army and when I was gone, um, I'd be on my knees praying to God that this woman would be a part of my life for the rest of my life. And so he, he made that happen. And uh, I'm not a, a reverent death to him for that. But, um, the, uh, the dedication to um, our marriage, it, it, what I was going to say was that when we, uh, we were just recently looking at some old videos of when we got married, <laughs> it was awesome. Well, it was actually awesome because I remember what I was thinking when, when, when we were saying our vows and I was just looking at this beautiful woman who I just was just so adored and in my mind, in my heart, I, all I, I think about is that she's giving her life to me. She's turning it all over. I'm responsible for, for her, for her, you know, whatever love, you know, just the basics of taking care of her, right? Here's this knuckle dragon guy that's got a, no zero responsibilities up to that point. And now I've got this big responsibility from <laughs> the kids, but um, um, yeah, the fact that she trusted me with her life um, I took that very seriously, and I think that she would say the same thing. Um, so, just you know, so sort of fast forwarding then to what our kids observed about of us. Yeah, were we perfect? I mean, were we perfect in the way that we um, taught our kids the faith? I mean, we talked about our faith all the time. We tried to be example by the way that we live, but you know, it's. Every kid's def definitely different. If you know our kids, um, they're, they're, they're very different. Um, one of them now is, uh, has broken away from the faith. We love him, and he loves us um, dearly. Um, he's very, very honest. You know, He's a very smart guy. And we're, we just continue to pray for him that he'll come back, um, and we know that he will. Um, we've got one daughter who's a, you know, works down at Damascus. She was a missionary, and now she's on staff there. So... It just shows that there's, you know, this, this the, the, uh, some of the seed falls on rocky soil, some falls on rocky, or on good soil, so, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that what our kids hopefully observe in us is our example, and especially the love that we have for each other and the durability of our, our marriage. So, um, yeah. Uh, what else we can uh, talk about? I think we're getting close on time. Nice job. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. You just see the, the witness of the love between you guys. And I have to say that was something important with Walt and I when we got married was to see the dedication of his parents and my parents through difficult times. Mm -hmm. was, so that's, that's awesome. And I know you're 
your children will see that. Even our son, who is not the one that's one way to the kids, he always says he had a hard time finding a girlfriend because he wants to find someone like me so he can have a relationship like ours. And we try to go back to where that comes from, you know. And I think he knows, but he doesn't. But he just can't give up his stronghold on his opinion of that. So I think eventually um, he will. Yeah. Everything um, you're saying is awesome. Your the vocal is really murky through your microphone. Are you guys hearing murkiness? Waskoviches and Erickson's are they a little hard to hear? Yeah, a little bit. Just a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. I can hear him just fine. Father Mark taught me how to read lips, though. So <laughs> <laughs> he was very wise. Bill and Lori, we love you guys. Go ahead. You were gonna say something, Bill. Uh, I was just gonna say that. Can you hear me now if I speak yeah, up? That's, that's perfect. All right. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to see what uh, your, the, the kind of men that your daughters will be looking to marry, look in the mirror because uh, we can already see that that's, that is coming through. Y'all have daughters. That, that's, they're going to be looking for guys that are like, Lord, was talking about my son who you know, wants what we have. We can talk to him in depth about, well, this is why we're still together. This is why we're happy. And a big component of it is our faith and our relationship with God and our, the fact that we'll try to grow together in our faith, um, whereas a lot of people grow apart, you know? Um, but uh, same thing with the daughters, especially the daughters. They're looking for a strong man, a strong, uh, confident guy, um, somebody like their dad that they, can, they know they can trust. Uh, they know that that um, has their back and will take care of them. And um, so be the example as a father and you're, you're, you won't have any worries about who your daughter is because she's going to want to just like you. As long as you want her to be with somebody like you. So <laughs> there's that caveat. I was very grateful to Exactly. Bill and Lori, we love you guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for being with us. Thanks Blessed so. to be on the team with you. Awesome job. God bless you guys. Steph. So we have this segment now, we're kind of coming in slowly for a, a landing, but we wanted to add this component to include the great feminine genius that we have present with us. So now is a chance for you, Facebook, wonderful people to join us if you'd like in any way, shape or form, but we're gonna raise the subject, we're calling it homegrown, the kind of metaphor of maybe a field, right? Like a home is like a field. And we parents are called to till the soil, cultivate it, to plant seeds, and to cultivate these children that God has entrusted to us for eternal life. And we know that, you know, modern era, which I would define as maybe the last 40, 50, 60 years, we haven't had the kind of intimate connection. And many of us, you know, have only learned of late how to cultivate and till that soil in our homes. And here's a great opportunity. Just take a moment for the wonderful women of this group to simply maybe share a few thoughts on some of the challenges, maybe some of you women and men, are facing in being at home with your children and your spouse, most importantly, and your children. So, Janine, I hand the baton to you. Okay, well, we homeschooled before, but um, I think a lot of people, especially like in my mom's group, were complaining about like their time schedule. They were very stressed out, very nervous, felt like um, they had to... I don't know, such, such a schedule, but I think like making it your own, just like you say with the family lit and um, these kids can do a lot on their own. You know, you shouldn't have to do a lot for them and just kind of monitoring it. You know, you don't have to keep such a tight schedule. And, um, you know, I, I feel like my kids are pretty responsible. I just check progress book after they're done and oh, yeah. they're doing well. Um, and she's not shy to bring in the heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Which is you, right, Mike? That's you. Yeah, if you see my stomach coming now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Great words of wisdom. So true. I think too many parents that I've talked to, the moms in particular, feel like they have to do they're basically doing it with, they don't have that in school. They don't have the teacher guiding them step by step by step right next to them, right? There has to be that, you know, um, 
independence that's still there, certainly with the guidance and task mastering and all that. And when there is a genuine need and question and circling up, um, but remember it's your kids schooling, it's not yours. Liz. So I'm gonna have to say that every year, the, the make it your own, like you said, Jeannie is definitely, every year for me, it's been different. Um, every time, you know, every time I'm pregnant or there's a new baby or there's a toddler, you know, adds different dynamics to it. And we just kind of go with it and figure out what works best. Um, I know that sometimes it can be stressful having, you know, Lucy, two-year-old running around while we're trying to read or, you know, but there's been some beauty in that too, because the olders have learned to, okay, it's my turn to have Lucy Well, mom works with so-and-so. So they're, you know, they're learning some mommy skills along with their school, which I think is, is more important in some aspects, because, you know, a lot of our girls are going to be moms someday, you know, so I think there's beauty in, in it, and they're also learning how to care for the home, and learning chores, and how to cook, and all that beautiful stuff, so I think it's a wonderful thing, but like um, Jeannie said, we also have homeschooled from the get-go, so I don't really know what it's like from the other world. So. We put our no. dogs in cages, though, now and then. <laughs> we so, did. Our boys. We, we, we did, our boys. We did say, our boys when, when Zeke was two, we said, I think we need a cage for Zeke. But we really didn't do that. <laughs> you and Obama. Who did I? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, You're going to be having some comments on that yep, one. Yep, I'm sure we will. <laughs> uh, just, I just want to add one thing very quickly as we're starting to come in for a landing, um, just praying about, you know, what to share tonight. And it went all over the place. But right before um, we started, I felt very strongly that, you know, thinking about the Eucharist, how we don't have it, right, to be able to receive. And the word Eucharist means Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So I guess my word of encouragement is to bring that idea of Thanksgiving into our homes, specifically with schooling. I think moms in particular take things very personally. You know, we're pouring ourselves out, whether we've been homeschooling or this is a new thing and the gratitude isn't necessarily there. So I think um, just to whatever we can do to plant those seeds of gratitude, first and foremost, starting with you know, ourselves, wives, I challenge you and encourage you when you're around your kids and all these extra moments right now to be affirming and encouraging and pointing out gratitudes for your husband and their father, right? And, and just to kind of create that atmosphere and environment and husbands to do the same. I know a lot of you guys are diving in there helping with homeschooling too, or just that acknowledgement of um, things that a lot of times get taken for granted and such. And so just to create that language of gratitude and, you know, stop and have your kids do the same thing. So I think, again, um, that can really be an atmosphere changer when you're focused on Eucharistos, gratitude. So bring the Eucharist into your homes in that way, even amidst the craziness and struggles, and um, just step back and take that pause mm -hmm. of what really matters and to verbalize it. Because I think too often we take so much for granted or we assume that they know, you know, so. So we are going to okay. do a parental. Can I say one more thing, Greg? Please do. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but uh, mm -hmm. one thing I know, sometimes I get all caught up on the academics and then make sure everything, they get everything done when I have you. And something that Walt has done a very good job of is we are training our kids for heaven and what's more important. So just, you know, we're trying to make saints. And so we're forming them as saints. And so sometimes the academics aren't perfect and it's okay. They'll, they'll, they'll catch up. <laughs> and kids learn in so many other ways outside of a book. Mm -hmm. So we are so blessed by you and you, and we're going to do, um, I'm sure a parental powwow live, maybe an addition where women have an opportunity to talk about this subject. Um, and invite as many as possible. We hope to keep doing these. We have two more nights after tonight. Um, and it's just such a great opportunity for us to connect and share ideas and support each other. But here's a great segue. Uh, we're gonna land this pretty quickly here. Um, everybody here has done this live it gathering guide. 
And I encourage you all to go there to ilovemyfamily.us. What is it? Basically, it's an invitation to bring your family together on a regular basis to talk and pray. And we provide a very easy to use gathering guide to do that. And we get it. We get that you've never inherited this skill set or confidence from your parents to do this. But when's the last time you really had meaningful conversation with your spouse and your children? That's what this is all about. All the families here tonight have done this. Dozens of families have done this. And all of them speak of the tremendous grace to cultivate a culture of forgiveness, of apology, of praying over one another, of sharing those depths of our hearts. So as Liz and Janine and Steph kind of spoke, yes, the academics, they're important. And you got to do that. But at the heart of that is the education and love. And that's this kind of stuff. So this is just taken from that Live It Gathering guide, Famdemic, spread the love. Just here's a daily prescription that we give you. We challenge you. We encourage you. We invite you to every day find a time to meaningfully bring your family together and give everybody an opportunity to respond to each of these questions. Something you're grateful for, a recent victory, a current challenge, an affirmation of someone, and something meaningful happening. If you do this, what's going to happen? And I'll just be real brief here. If you do this, not only are you going to be more attuned when your dad or your mom are grumpy to hear what's going on in their life or us to our children, what's going on in their life. Number two, you're going to be merciful. You're going to pray for them. You're going to say, wow, dad is going through this difficult time. He lost his job or he's worried about finances or whatever. And he shared that. So, you know, you're going to be, you're going to pray for him. And thirdly, if you keep sharing these things over time, you know that there's an accountability. You know that there's hopefully day after day, we're going to be working on those challenges. So it becomes literally what a home is meant to be, a saint-making machine, a saint-making culture where we're sharing our hearts. And I'm just telling you, our oldest is going to be 22. Our youngest is going to be 14, six kids. 15? That must be 15. Wow. All right. Shows you what I know. Um, don't, it, it becomes the fundamental basis for their success in every other way, every other way. If they are connected to God who is love in one another, and they learn to communicate that and be transparent, it is the fabric of excellence of what Matthew Kelly says, becoming the best version of yourself. So let me go back to the share screen here for the one final dealy deal. And uh, it's a technical term, dealy deal. And uh, so next, tomorrow, tomorrow night, we've got we're blessed with a priest from our diocese, wonderful Father Matt Rader, our regular house call, which is anything but regular, our extraordinary in the ordinary house call at the Elmores, music by Alicia Hearn and a wonderful musician. She, her last name is Doman. If you went to Steubenville, you would know the Doman name. They're phenomenal musicians and leaders, Catholic leaders throughout the country. And uh, they have a wonderful organization. Alicia and her husband, Mike Hernan, who was a leader at, the, at Steubenville for many years, and um, now they have a full-time parental ministry, a lot like ours. So she's going to be le uh, playing a song that has been in my heart since she wrote it three decades ago on Our Blessed Mother. So I'm glad she's going to be there tomorrow night to lead this, that. The story shared by John Mark and Teresa Grodi, we're very excited that they're with us. And we skipped the couple contest tonight just because we are running out of time. But we are so blessed that you are here to join us. We find it a sacred time beyond space and time. Know that God loves you. Know that he is in this. He's in this with us. I'm going to put the Waskoviches on the spot, if you guys will accept the spot, just to lead us in a closing prayer. Oh, I'm terrible at this. No, you're good. good. Great, awesome. great old Catholic ah, that just has all his prayers memorized. I love it. That's okay. right. You do what you want to do. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Heavenly Father. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to get together tonight over this virtual meeting to bring your love and joy and all the good things in this world that are all from you. Thank you for this opportunity to have this discussion and to learn from each other and to get inspired uh, from uh, fellow married couples, from Father Mark, from an extraordinary uh, musician, and, and really for the Schleters for putting this all together. We thank you for your son who taught us the way to pick up our cross, to fast and pray and give all that we have uh, to do the Heavenly Father's will. And I just ask, come Holy Spirit, come, come into our hearts, come into our lives, 
help us to finish Lent strong and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus in just a quick 10 short days. Uh, through this, through Jesus Christ, we ask um, for your love and for your favor upon us. Uh, amen. 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 Awesome. In the name of the Father, amen. Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Listen, amen. buddy, you, you rocked that out. Mm -hmm. That was truly amazing. Thank God you. bless you all, family, whatever we call you, parental powwow, people on the journey with us. We'll see you tomorrow <laughs> at 830. God bless you.